Do you love watching uh, Olympic Games? I do. I uh, even, you know, I wish that uh, even in the stands I would be able to watch the Olympic Games. So I have three years to save for the Tokyo Olympic Games in 2020. I am so amazed by the feats of these uh, athletes. They are simply incredible. And one thing that is obvious of all uh, with these Olympic athletes is their training. They've years. They've spent. Uh, years, years of training, years of preparation for that big event. But even then, a few fail, failed miserably. For example, the relay teams of the U.S. in the 2012, they were able to pass the baton legally and uh, also because of uh, drug uh, cases like Ben Johnson. And some, they were already there, but they weren't able to participate because they were killed. Remember that 1972 Munich Olympics. Now, do you know that there will be a much bigger event? But you will, all, you will be, every one of us will be enrolled as a participant. We will not just watch it, we will be enrolled as a participant. And that event that I'm talking about, the most amazing event in world history is the second coming of the Lord Jesus Christ. And listen to how Jesus described it in Luke 21, 25 to 28. There will be signs in the sun, moon, and stars. On the earth, nations will be in anguish and perplexity at the roaring and tossing of the sea. People will faint from terror, apprehensive of what is coming on the world. For the heavenly bodies will be shaken. At that time, they will see the Son of Man coming in a cloud with power and great glory. When these things begin to take place, stand up and lift up your heads because your redemption is drawing near. The question is, are we ready to meet Jesus? Are we ready for this big event? You may think, yes, you know, Pastor, I've trusted Jesus as my Savior and Lord. In one sense, that is true. But the Bible also teaches us that every believer must be prepared for his return. Jesus concluded his discourse, his Olivet discourse, with a warning to the disciples in Mark 13, 33-37. It reads, Be on guard. Be alert. You do not know when that time will come. It's like a man going away. He leaves his house and puts his servants in charge, each with their assigned task, and tells the one at the door to keep watch. Therefore, keep watch. Because you do not know when the owner of the house will come back, whether in the evening or at midnight or when the rooster crows or at dawn. If he comes suddenly, do not let him find you sleeping. Would you please look at the person beside you? Is he already sleeping? What I say to you, I say to everyone, watch. The apostle John heard Jesus spoke those words. And John has warned us that in, we are already in the last hour with many deceivers trying to lead us astray from the truth. With this danger in mind, he gave us, remember, three tests. The moral test, which is obedience to the commands of the Lord Jesus Christ. The relational or the social test, which is loving brethren, loving one another in spite of. And the third is the doctrinal test, which is holding on to the truth of the, of the person and the work. Of Jesus Christ. Now here in verses 28 to chapter 3 verse 10, he begins a second application of the test, of the moral test. But before we continue, let us uh, commit this time to the Lord. Our Heavenly Father, we thank you for your word and your word, Lord, is meant for our edification. Would you please illumine us, open the eyes of our hearts, give us an understanding of your word. Show us ourselves, our need, our sin, our Savior. And Lord, get glory for yourself. Empower me. This is our prayer in the mighty name of Jesus. Amen. May I request everyone to please rise as we read our text this morning. It's found in 1 John chapter 2, verses 28 to 29. Can we read it together? 1, 2, 3. And now, continue in Him. So that when he appears, we may be confident and ashamed before him.
You may be seated. Praise God. May the Lord address him for the reading of his word. Now, John makes three simple statements, important points in the verses that we've read. First, Jesus Christ is coming again. Can we again draw, uh, put it back on screen, the text? The phrase, when he appears, in Greek, it literally means, if he appears. Now, perhaps you're asking, Pastor, that is conditional, di ba? But if, there seems to be an uncertainty. But the uncertainty is not about the fact of his coming. The uncertainty is the time. When will he return? The fact that Jesus Christ is coming again bodily is either true or the Bible is false. Or we can say it another way. Either Jesus Christ is coming bodily, visibly, in power and greater glory, or He is a liar and we cannot trust Him at all. Now, if Jesus Christ is a liar, every one of us will go to hell. But Jesus ascertains the fact of His second coming by saying, Heaven and earth will pass away, but my words will not pass away. More than you can trust the ground, underneath your feet or this the foundation of this building more than you can trust you know that the moon will be up there tonight or the stars even if it is cloudy or the sun will set later this afternoon or the sun will rise the words of the lord jesus christ i tell you you can trust them you can trust jesus christ the jesus second coming is not a matter of prophetic speculation it is a certain fact if it is not true then we cannot trust jesus at all james boyce writes one verse in 25 deals with the lord's return it is mentioned 380 times in the 260 chapters of the new testament it, in, it is mentioned in every one of the new testament books with the exception of galatians which deals with a particular doctrinal problem and the very short books such as 2nd and 3rd John and Philemon. So you see, Jesus report, repeatedly mentioned His own return. Yes, believers disagree a lot about uh, details on prophecy. For example, the rapture, millennium, tribulation. There are, there are obviously good reasons for each view. But there is one thing, every believer, no matter what his prophetic view is, holds as absolutely true. Jesus Christ is coming back bodily as the conquering judge and king. So that's the first point. The second one, when Christ comes, some will be confident, but others will be ashamed. We may be confident and unashamed before him. At his coming, John indicates that there are two possibilities when the Lord returns. One, we, you may be confident, unashamed, or you will shrink away from him in shame. Have you been in an embarrassing situation before? You know, the pastor last year, I think this was September, October, I baptized, I think, two individuals. And you know, I always joke. I say, uh, I always tell them, well, uh, I have to wear my bikini brief uh, or else we won't be able to have our baptism. But you know what? The Lord is really such a humorous God. Imagine I left my shorts and they were already prepared there. I am in my bikini brief. You know, I was walking towards the pool. I was, you know, sabi ko, bakat ba, bakat? And when I got inside the water, in the water, the, the, the friend of, uh, the brother of Carl said, yung brief ni Pastor nakikita. So embarrassing. You know, we were in the uh, country club of uh, Brittany. And uh, I was, and every time that I would uh, submerge, tama ba the term? My, my gown would go up, you know. <laughs> you know. But now, what, what is he referring to, John, regarding, or who is he referring to? Those who will be unashamed. Now, there are two, or who, those who will be ashamed, though, there are two schools of thought. The primary, in the primary sense, some say they refer to the heretics and their followers. 
they, for a while, they profess to know Jesus Christ, but they turn away. Okay? They turned away, showing that their faith was not genuine or saving faith. They have denied His rightful place as the sovereign Lord. And they turned to, instead, to um, foolish speculations, sp uh, special revelations or secret knowledge that puff them up with pride in their supposed knowledge. Because by their denial of Jesus Christ, they will be ashamed when He returns. And when Christ comes, He will also be ashamed of them. They will shrink back, shrink back in fear and shame when they see Him in His power. Now, in a in secondary sense, it may also refer to, they say, to believers. But it will be only momentary in duration in which even these true believers, they will be ashamed when He comes because their work their service in ministry was done out of selfish motives, out of prideful motives, out of wrongful motives. Why are you here in church? You know, when you go, when you go to that time when our works will be judged. You know, yes, we, they will be saved, but as through fire when their works are burned up. When their works are burned up. Brothers and sisters in Christ, we may have a brief moment, a brief moment of shame and regret. We know, you know, even we, we conscientiously serve the Lord, but we are painfully aware of our shortcomings. We are painfully aware of our failures. And there will be that brief moment of regret, of shame perhaps. Lord, if I have done more for you, if I have done more for you. Now they're saying that, well, these believers, they will regret in a short time because they will also be transformed quickly into their uh, new bodies and they will enter heaven in a perfect resurrection bodies. But listen, for those who abide in Christ, they will be confident, unashamed, Unashamed. You know, the word confidence, it, in Greek, it means courage, boldness, fearlessness, especially in the presence of persons of high rank. The word used for coming was used of the visit of a king or emperor. If you ever had to go to a high-ranking official, diba? Uh, you would at first feel nervous, perhaps, uh, when you were in high school, where, oi, the principal is... Uh, uh, has asked you to be in his office. Diba you feel a little bit nervous? Pocket. Or perhaps uh, you're in college or the dean wants to talk to you. Well, first, you'll be a little bit nervous, right? Or perhaps here na lang. Oy, the elders would like to talk to you. Bakit ako? Right? But you know, John is saying that when we meet Jesus Christ, we have that confidence. We will be unashamed when we meet Him. How, how would that happen? How can we be unashamed? How can we be confident when He returns? And that leads me to the... Actually, this is the main uh, sermon. The first two, they're just an introduction. So, mahaba na naman introduction ni Pastor. To be ready for Christ's coming, you must abide in Him as a little child. The command is very simple. Abide in Him. Abide in Him. Abide is one of John's favorite words. And he uses it more than all the New Testament writers combined. He uses it 24 times in 1 John. Jesus used the word 11 times. Okay? It is used both in God abiding in us and we abiding in Him. There is a sense in which every true believer abides, remains in Christ. But the fact that we are commanded to abide in Him implies persistent and purposeful action on our part. That's uh, Robert Law. Now, what does it mean to abide in Him? Allow me to share with you five things. First, to abide in Him means He is Savior and Lord of your life. Remember our text last Sunday in verse 27? Allow me to read that. As for you, the anointing you receive from Him remains in you, and you do not need anyone to teach you, but as His anointing, teaches you about all things, and as that anointing is real, not counterfeit, 
just as it has taught you, remain in Him. And so abiding in Him and yielding to His influences will mean believing on the Lord Jesus Christ. It will mean embracing Jesus and a Savior and Lord of your life. Now, at the outset, I need to point this out that many in the evangelical circle say that, well, you can accept Jesus as Savior, but you can follow Him na lang later. Did you get that? You accept Him, Jesus as Savior now, but you can follow Him as Lord later. Okay? I cannot find any basis for such teaching in the New Testament. But we can find many teachings in the Scriptures that would refute that teaching. To believe in Jesus Christ, essentially, brothers, and necessarily means you have to follow Him as Lord of your life. Diba? That's what they sang. Lord of all. May you be glorified. Everything that I am, everything that I have, Lord, this is for you. Salvation is not just a decision that a man makes. It is the power of God raising dead souls to eternal life. And they sang, God who began a good work in you will be faithful to what? Complete it. To complete it. Now when you say, Pastor, you know, three years ago, I'm so active in the church. I usher, I serve, I sing. But now I don't know. For the past year, I don't go to church anymore. I don't read the Bible. Then He has not started that good work in you. Because He says, He will start and complete it. The good work that He has laid, He will complete it in you. He who has begun a good work in you. The new life that God imparts to us inevitably results, brothers and sisters in Christ, through a new life that is in accord with its nature, growth in holiness. The seed of the word results in the fruit of it will always bear fruit into eternal life. Okay? The seed of the word will always bear fruit unto eternal life. If a person claims to be a believer, if a person claims he knows Christ, but he doesn't grow in obedience to the commands of God, that he doesn't sin less and less and less, he is fooling himself. And it's so sad that when he says, Lord, Lord, on that fearful day, he will hear these awful words, I don't know you, depart from me. Depart from me, you who practice lawlessness. The scariest words that we'll ever, ever hear. I don't know you. In Paul's words, he says in Titus 1.16, they profess to know God, but by their deeds they deny Him, being detestable, disobedient, worthless for any good deed. Now, salvation, listen to this, is absolutely free, but it would cost you your very life. Did you get that? Salvation is both absolutely free. But it will, yet it will cost you your very life. You receive it freely at no expense on you. But when you receive it, what will happen? You have just committed everything you are, everything you have to Jesus Christ. And that you will say, Pastor, isn't that a contradiction? Something is free and then it is costly? How is that? Let me illustrate. Suppose I have a desire to climb Mount Everest. It's only a desire. Right? I, I really, no, no. I, I really don't want to go there. This is just an illustration. Uh, my desire is to go climb Mount Everest. But the cost of the expedition would be very costly. For example, it would say $100,000. I don't know. I think it's more. $100,000. Then a philanthropist heard of that desire. Oh, Pastor Boyet. Hey, he called GCF and he marked. I will answer for the expedition expenses of Pastor Boyer to climb Mount Everest. I will hire the Sherpas that he needs. I will uh, uh, buy him those expensive clothing and gears that he needs. And months of training, I will pay for all those things. If I will accept that offer, I have committed my life 
to months of training and arduous effort and even my life because we know that every there are other mountain climbers who are very good but they didn't make it to Mount Everest it's free but it will cost you your life that's why he is the Lord everything you are everything you have committed to Jesus Christ Jesus Christ freely <laughs> offers the water of life to anyone who thirsts but anyone who receives it he is not already his own you are already bought with a price you are not your own because he has bought you with a price can you look at the person beside you ano bang halaga niyan sa inyo dollar peso you are bought with the blood of Christ you are bought with a price so to follow Christ, we must consider the cost and not begin to follow Him superficially only to turn back later when things get tough or rough. Abide in Him as Jesus, as Savior and Lord of your life. Second, to abide in Him, you must be in Him. Believers are never commanded actually to be in Christ because that is already a fact. But we are commanded to abide in Him. When you trust Jesus as Lord, Savior and Lord of your life, you are placed in Him. Now, placed in Him is a phrase that Paul often uses to describe our permanent position of identification in Christ. And all the blessings and all the riches that He bestows to us, on us, by His grace. We can see that in Ephesians chapter 1. The position of being in Christ comes to us through a new birth when we are born into the family of God. Let your life abide in Him in the sense of being directed by Him. You see, the head directs all the members of the body except for the involuntary muscles, no, Doc? The head. So the order which lifts my hand which opens my, my palm or closes my fist and lowers it down comes from the mind, the headquarters, the control system. Abide in your life by implicitly acknowledging His headship. Let every regulation of your life come from Him who is the head. As <clears throat> let it be obeyed as the natural, uh, natural desires of the mind that comes from the brain are obeyed by every part of the body. For example, just imagine if my right leg was given an independent authority from the brain. What would happen? The brain would tell me, go forward. But my leg, which is independent from the brain, would like to go sideways. Imagine, what, what would that be? Diva? You know, but they were so painful to see. But we know that that man is sick. Have you seen a person with a motor with a nerve injury where he jerks randomly or he throws his arm or leg without reason? Like that? It's so painful to see. But we know that that person is sick. Or just imagine if you don't abide in him. Oh. Perhaps spiritually you don't know, but you're walking like that. Or you're, you're, you're jerking. Brothers and sisters in Christ, if you wonder how you can know if you've been born again, look for signs of new life. Look for signs. Do you love God's Word? Do you obey? God's commands. Do you really desire to do them? Do you see an outgoing sanctification in your life that you are sinning less and less and less and progressing in holiness? Do you desire to walk in the Spirit? Do you cry out to Him, Lord, mold me, use me, send me for your glory?
There are many more signs of being born again. If you have been born again, you are in Christ. To abide in Him is both passive and active at the same time. I think this is the reason why some people say that you don't need Him as Lord. You know, they always attach abiding in Him as passive only. There is a popular teaching that if you are abiding, then you don't exert or strive any effort. You are simply resting all that is Jesus for you as the branch passively abides passively in the vine. Okay? But that is only half of the truth. But not all of it. There is a passive sense in which we rest, we trust in Jesus Christ for our strength, for our life. We will accomplish nothing. We will accomplish nothing of value for God unless we abide in Him. In that sense, we trust in Him. But there is also a command that we abide in Him and it implies, it implies active. So what does it mean? The active side involves doing the three things. Passing the three things. Obeying His commands, which is the moral. Loving one another in spite of. And holding tenaciously to the truth of the gospel. So it's both. It's passive and active. It's not just passive alone. To abide in Him. Yes, we trust in Him. But there must be things, signs of new life that can be seen in you. Fourth, to abide in Him means to live righteously. This is what we see in verse 29. If you know that He is righteous, you know that everyone who does what is right has been born of Him. This explains, this verse explains to us how we can uh, we cannot be ashamed when He returns. We are to live righteously. It also anticipates the theme in chapter 3, verses 4 to 10, which will be discussed in the coming Sundays. You know, John says, if you know that He is righteous, it has a sense of sins. Since He is righteous. He is righteous. Now, don't mistake the point of verse 29. It is not saying that righteous living is the cause or the condition of having a new birth. But it is exactly the opposite. It means that righteous behavior, the righteous behavior is the evidence of new birth. Because God is righteous. Those truly born of Him will live righteously. Okay? Will live righteously in the overall pattern of their lives. We are born of Him and therefore, you know, He grants to us everything pertaining to life and godliness. Just imagine that. He has granted to us everything pertaining to life and godliness. But living righteously is a process. It's a lifelong process of growth in obedience to His Word. If you don't read the Bible, how can that process start? You have to begin so that you will grow in obedience. It does not happen instantly that tomorrow, Lord, tomorrow, tomorrow, uh, you will be now my Lord and I will live righteously. Hmm. You know, yesterday in that seminar, the men were really so blessed, especially when uh, Elder Rex talked about uh, being excellent, you know, being excellent. And what is your motive? Is your motive in working, in serving the Lord, is it really for God? And then there is this another speaker who mentioned, I think I was hit, you know, it impacted me. It talks about gaming addiction. And you know, this person, he is an honor student at Wharton University. And when he, even he was already married, he's still addicted to games. And you know what he said? For every day, I would compute. Four hours, I would spend time playing. And just imagine those four hours. What will happen if I would pray for my pastor, if I pray for my missionaries, if I would teach or I would learn another language? It could have meant so many things to me. But I spent, actually it's not only four hours, right? While the, rest, the whole morning, he's playing. 
He's playing. You know, Pastor Boyd also has a problem with uh, chess. You know, sometimes he would say, oh, naka-chess ka naman. But I don't play that much chess, but I am anticipating the moves of Wesley. So if he is in a game, and that's why when he moves, we have 15 minutes, sometimes their games would last three hours. So three hours ako nanonood noon. Ah, ang galing, nakuha ko yung move. Grandmaster move. Diba? And that excites me. But what is it? I'm wasting my time. I thought I've been praying for you. Right? Live righteously. Think. Think biblically. If you would spend that time watching telenovela and compromising not going to the prayer concert, do you think that would mean living righteously? You know, if you are born again, if you are born again, you will be learning to judge every thought, every attitude, every motive by God's word. You will seek to please the Lord beginning from the thought level. Now, if your mind is corrupt, if your mind has lustful thoughts, how could you seek pleasing the Lord? It always begins from the thought level. The fruit of the Holy Spirit is growing in your character. Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. Are they growing in your character, in your life? And you know what? You will be disciplining yourself for the purpose of godliness. And that's what I'm saying. Lord, if I will spend three hours naman playing chess, siguro pwede na lang 30 minutes and two hours and a half, I will pray, I will study, I will read. Lord, if I will watch Korean telenovela, siguro it's better. Oh, mga iba pa nga, di ba? You will buy uh, this, several this. Oh, I'm watching four series of this now. Di ba? Doon sa Facebook. But if you will spend time, just think, make it more productive na lang kaya. Make it more productive. Sabi, Elder Rex, oh, excellence. Di ba? How can you work excellently? Di ba? You just... Okay, you studied your lessons, then morning, you were playing. Pag gising niya umaga, good morning, mama. Pero wala eh. Bakit? You spent hours playing. Playing. Of course, everything will be done in independence or of the Holy Spirit. But we must actively involve ourselves in the process. Number five, to abide in Him means to be at home with Him. And to be an alien to this world. We've discussed this already in verses 15 to 17 when John draws the line between loving the Father and loving the world. Abide in Him as an element of your life. Let Him encompass you just as air surrounds you on all sides. As a fish, well, as a fish whether it's Pandaka Pygmia or Orca. They would abide in water. They would not live out of the element of water. In the same way as Christians, we must abide in Christ. We do not have to live in the world. We do not have to live in the sin of this world. Because Christ is our life. Christ is our life. Can you tell, tell the person beside you, Christ is your life. Christ is your life. Now listen. If you are more comfortable watching TV, or watching godless movies. Or hanging around with worldly friends and joining them in their vain entertainment. You are not abiding in Him. If you have secret areas of your life that you lock God out, you are not abiding in Him. You are not abiding in Him. To abide in Him means that He is at home in your life and you are at home in Him. You feel increasingly like an alien, a foreigner to this evil world. Chapter 3 verse 1 says, For this reason the world does not know us because it did not know Him. They will never know us. Or they will never understand us. Why is, why is Joseph like this? Why is Elder Carlo like this? We're asking, you know, Friday night, Elder Carlo, you are the new GM. Come on, let's drink. And they will never understand. Bakit ayaw niya? 
Siguro ko report, ayaw mag-share. Brothers and sisters and friends, the world will never understand us if we abide in Him. We will never compromise the truth about Him. We will stand above His banner always, always, when we abide in Him. Much more could be said, but uh, I have less time, so I have to go to the second point. Second point pa lang matatapos na. Abide in Him as little children. John's words, little children, abide in Him, suggest at least three simple truths. As a little child, do not overcomplicate the Christian life. Little children implies simple Simple. Abiding in Christ is simple. You don't have to finish a degree to understand, to practice that principle. Jesus Christ, in fact, said, unless you are converted and become like children, you will not enter the kingdom of heaven. <coughs> May I ask you these questions? And answer them. Do I spend consistent, regular time alone with the Lord in the Word? If you will evaluate your life this week, the past days, how would you rate yourself from 1 to 10? Were you able to read the Word of God? Were you able to have time with Him? Were you able... Am I trusting God by drawing near in prayer to His throne of grace? Not only in all of your trials, in life. How much time have you spent reading and praying? If you compare that with the time that you've spent playing basketball, playing chess, or playing computer games, how would, it, how would it compare? Third, am I faithful as a steward of all that God has entrusted to me? Maintaining integrity and putting off greed. Brothers and sisters in Christ, this is my first time to make an appeal. Well, our finances have gone down by 20% last month. And as we can see, we have made so many renovations to... To save 8000 a month for our Sunday school, we have our new Sunday school room. You can visit there. That's why I was evicted, but I have a new uh, office there. Okay? And uh, I am making this appeal because, as you can see, we have these two big speakers here. Our mixer, sirat na po. It's broken. And it is beyond repair. It is only by His mercy that's why we have sound. You know, when the elders, Elder Rex, Elder Joey, and the other elders, when they pray, you know, it's really very strong, the, the prayer of the righteous. That's why I have sound. Lord, wag niyo munang kunin, baka hindi naman tindihan. Okay? And the cost is 300,000 more. Okay? But praise God. To keep, to start the ball rolling, Someone donated 50000 but he's not a mem she's not a member of the church. In fact, we haven't seen her yet. And she donated 50,000 pesos. I pray. I pray as good stewards. Would you help us? Help us to have our new mixer and hopefully that we could buy a digital one. And it would cost us more than 300 right? So that's my appeal for everyone. So the, the next question is, am I growing in holiness, developing the fruit of the Spirit by walking in the Spirit? Am I judging, confessing, and forsaking sin, beginning on the thought level? Am I working at maintaining and deepening the relationships with those in my life, especially in my immediate family? This includes truthful, loving communication, listening, kindness, patience, forgiveness, and humility. Brothers and sisters in Christ, this is not rocket science. This is basic Christian living. And those who applied these principles, abiding in Him, you know, they have endured terrible suffering and even martyrdom with God's joy. With God's joy. Invariably, when people have serious personal or family problems, they are failing on those points and the other basics of Christian living. 
Second, as a little child, depend on your father for everything. Little children depend on their parents for everything. Parents must provide and protect. Pro protect them and provide for them. You know, children, little children would not survive even a day if their parents would abandon them to the elements. Now, if you are abiding in the Father as a little child, you depend on Him for your provisions, for your protection, for your life. You take every need to Him in prayer and draw near Him as, no, draw near to Him as your loving and caring Father. You know, when trials come in your life and you don't actively draw near to Him, you will be angry. You will be bitter at God and you will fall away. You will turn your backs from Him. That's why Peter writes in 1 Peter 5, 7 to 11, cast all your anxiety on Him because He cares for you. Be alert and of sober mind. Your enemy, the devil, crawls around like a roaring lion looking for someone to devour. Resist him. Stand firm in the faith because you know that the family of believers throughout the world is undergoing the same kind of sufferings. And the God of all grace, who called you to His eternal glory in Christ, after you have suffered a little while, will Himself restore you and make you strong, firm, and steadfast. To Him be the power forever and ever. Amen. As a little child, lastly, revel in the Father's great love for you. There is an implicit relationship between a father and his children. And fathers love their children with a special love. Amen, fathers? Amen. You love your children. We love our children with a special love. And that will be stated explicitly next Sunday when uh, Attorney Joey will uh, uh, preach on this in verses 1 to 3. But, you know, if we revel in God's great love, abiding in Him will not be a difficult chore, but it will be a great delight. And I thank the Lord for the leaders of this church when I see how much they love you. You know, today is the last day for our discipleship track. And Attorney Joey will explain what the gospel is. It's my prayer that you'll have time. You know, the gospel again separates eternity with God and eternity without God. And it is my prayer that if you are not yet sure of that, what that word is, gospel. What is it in your life? Would you be here this afternoon? Two o'clock? Two o'clock. Two o'clock. We want you to be assured of heaven. We want you to be prepared when He comes again. So are you ready for the biggest, most amazing event in world history? The answer to that question depends on the answer to this next question. Are you abiding in Him as a little child? If not, why not begin that today? Would you be with us this afternoon, 2 to 4? And would you also be alone with God and hold that, that, our devotional there and do your quiet time every day? And would you please, uh, Joe, flash again the questions that I've asked? Perhaps you want to make a screenshot of these guys. Go over these questions and prioritize where you need to begin. Change your daily schedule so that you can begin to implement these basics of abiding in Christ. And you know what? As you do, you will grow in confidence as you anticipate the coming of the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen? Lord, we are thankful for your word. And again, Lord, we know that is eternal, that is true. Help us, Lord, to apply this. Especially, Lord, the questions that have been asked, that we can work on those questions. And I pray also, Lord, for everyone here who hasn't attended the discipleship track one, I pray that you put in their hearts, move them, O oh God, that they will be with us this afternoon as we, uh, as Attorney Joey, will lecture on the gospel. 
Lord, I pray also that everyone here will really surrender everything that they are, everything that they have. They will commit it to Jesus Christ. Thank you. It's our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen.